It's a pleasure to be here at the next forum for quantum computing. First, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me here today to tell you about Quantinium and our H-series trapped ion quantum computers powered by Honeywell. Some of you may have heard about the recent combination of Cambridge Quantum and Honeywell Quantum Solutions to form a new company called Quantinium. It is the largest integrated quantum computing company in the world with almost 400 people across different locations around the globe. This is the convergence of the best quantum software with the highest performing quantum hardware. We are science-led and enterprise-driven with a focus on bringing value to our customers to solve real-world problems using quantum computing. We're working to accelerate the development of quantum computing in the hardware and platform agnostic manner. So our software can run on all sorts of quantum hardware besides our own H-series quantum computers. And different software platforms can also run on our H-series quantum computers as well. But our integrated solutions will allow us to optimize across the software and hardware layers to deliver more capabilities to our users, whether they're just getting in to quantum and looking for a package solution that will address their problems, or they are quantum experts looking for the best software tools and quantum computing hardware. So let me start by telling you about our trapped ion quantum com hard computing hardware. Our team has been working on quantum computers for the past decade. And about two years ago, we started making them available to our customers. In fact, Cambridge Quantum was the first external user to run a quantum circuit on our hardware. We chose trapped ion qubits because we, we wanted to make the highest performing quantum computers. Trapped ion qubits not only meet the DiVincenzo criteria, but their performance really excels compared to other types of qubits in terms of coherence times, gate fidelities, measurement fidelities, and qubit connectivity. Our systems have high fidelity operations, fully connected qubits, and a couple of special features, such as mid-circuit measurement and reset with conditional branching and arbitrary single qubit gates. These features are not new at all in the trapped ion world, but they do differentiate our systems from others in the commercial space. So our systems use the QCCD architecture, which was first proposed by the NIST ion storage group back in 1998. QCCD uh, stands for a quantum charge coupled device. The idea is that rather than having a long ion chain, you would have multiple zones on the ion trap device and move the ions to different locations to perform quantum operations on the qubits. What's nice about this architecture is that you can maintain short ion chains and avoid the complexity of dealing with more and more modes of motion, uh, even as the number of ions grow in your system. That way we can maintain high fidelity gates and have very low crosstalk. The qubit connectivity is taken care of by physically transporting the ions. The term QCCD was first coined uh, in this pa nature paper by Dave Kilpinski, Chris Monroe, and Dave Wineland, because this is similar to how electrons on the CCD move around a device to transfer and process information, except here it's the ions carrying quantum information and moving around on the device. But for a QCCD to function and scale, uh, we need to have ion traps to support that. And there have been a lot of research in the past couple of decades towards the QCCD architecture. The transport of ions and the physical trapping device go hand in hand because you have to design the trap electrodes and the voltages to apply to those electrodes in order to move the ions. Here are some examples of some different, uh, of what different groups have done. From some of the early 3D traps where different layers of electrodes stack on top of one another uh, to trap 
uh, surface traps where the electrodes lay on a single plane. Here's a picture of the HOA trap from Sandia. And this one is the first surface trap made by Honeywell in collaboration with Georgia Tech Research Institute. People have used uh, these different trap structures to figure out how to transport ions, trying to go as fast as they can, and sometimes with multiple ions and different species at the same time. Here's an example or examples of 2D arrays uh, with junctions. Uh, this one from NIST and this one is from uh, GTRI. So um, the research continues today uh, as ion trappers like this Apachinger group at University of Mainz in Germany demonstrated uh, transport and quantum circuits on a QCCD uh, very recently. So in 2020, we released our first uh, commercial quantum computer, System Model H0. This was the first demonstration of a fully operational QCCD-based quantum computer. H0 uh, only used half of this tra uh, trap device, and the current H1 system used the same trap um, and the same architecture, uh, but operates with a full device. The trap electrodes shown here are color-coded by their zone arrangements. You can do fast transport with three rows of independent electrodes with varying widths. The blue zones uh, are for quantum operations, the green zones and the red zones are for storage, and the gray zone at the end is where we load ions. We use the terbium-171 hyperfine levels uh, for, for our qubit storage. And we also have barium-138 ions for sympathetic cooling. Our system can transport um, and uh, do quantum operations in parallel in multiple zones across the device. I can show you uh, some animations of how this device works. Here's an in the image of the actual trap itself. And you can see uh, with the long RF rails and the rows of segmented electrodes on the top. If we zoom in on one end of the trap, uh, you'll find that there's a tiny hole where neutral atoms can come through from the backside of the chip. So we can load the trap by shining lasers on the atomic beam and photoionizing atoms to create ions. We'll need to apply the right voltages to the electrodes in order to catch the ions. But once we've trapped the ion, we can transport them into an interaction zone where we can inter initialize, measure, or perform single qubit gates on the qubit by turning on the corresponding lasers. Now for two qubit gates, we have to first combine ions from two different wells and turn on the two qubit gate beams to perform the entangling operation. And afterwards, uh, we can separate them and move them to their next location. To show how this works for a quantum algorithm, let's take this example circuit here. We mark the qubits as red, green, and blue, uh, so we can track them uh, on our, uh, on our tra tra trap here. Um, at t equals one, uh, well, we start with initializing them all to zero by optically pumping them uh, with a laser. At t equals one, uh, the circuit um, perf uh, performs a uh, Hadamard gates on H on the red and green qubits uh, by shining the gate lasers on them. And here they're already in the uh, gate zone. At T equals two, we need to perform a CNOT gate on the red and green qubits. So we have to first move them together um, and then we turn on the two qubit gate lasers to perform the operation. At T equals three, uh, 
uh, we need to perform a C naught between red and blue qubits. So we have to do this fancy swap um, and then move the red and uh, blue qubits together. Um, and then we turn on the two qubit gate beams on their zone to at the right um, to perform the gate. And finally, uh, at t equals four, uh, we measure the green qubit um, by shining the measurement beam on it. And that does not disturb the uh, quantum, the qubits in the other zones because they're very far away. So based on the outcome of that measurement, we can perform conditional quantum operations on the other ions. We can also reinitialize the green qubit and put it back to, into the circuit as a new qubit. Here are some videos of ions performing some of the transport moves. On the top are two distant ions coming together, um, and we can also reverse the process and separate them and move them apart again. On the bottom here, uh, we have two ions swapping their positions in the chain between left and right. We can do these transport operations with very high fidelity without losing the ions or heating them in the crack. And with these transport primitives, we can rearrange the ions in the trap in any order we want. We currently have two system model H1s online operating with 10 to 12 qubits. The coherent times is as long as a few seconds for these hyperfine qubits. And we try to maintain the measurement and gate fidelities above 99.5%. These special features uh, such as all-to-all -all connectivity, arbitrary single qubit rotations, and conditional branching really adds to the capability of our quantum computers that other commercial quantum computers cannot match. For example, conditional logic is a requirement for protocols for such as uh, quantum error correction and measurement-based quantum computing. And you can find that feature in any other commercial quantum computers today. We benchmark our systems using the quantum volume metric, which was first proposed by researchers at IBM. We find it useful because it represents, uh, it is a better representative of what a NISC uh, quantum computer can calculate uh, than something like qubit count. So to reach a quantum volume of two to the n, you have to be able to run random circuits for n with n qubits um, and with uh, uh, circuit depth n. And so to pass a quantum volume benchmark, the percentage of heavy outcome has to pass the threshold of two thirds with a high level of confidence. And here uh, we have data showing that uh, we passed the n equals 10 on a volume test, um, it's the latest results um, and, uh, for, for our system model H1. So two to the 10 is uh, 1,024. This is the highest quantum volume ever measured on any system to date. These random circuits uh, average out to a little over 102 qubit gates per circuit. And from our calibration data, you can see the gate fidelities and measurement fidelities are quite good. 99.99% for single qubit gates, 99.72 for two qubit gates, and 99.7% for measurement fidelity. And these are typical values we see on H1. The, on the right here, we plot the trajectory of quantum volume for the H series quantum computers. And they went from uh, a quantum volume of 16 in the beginning of 2020 on, H, on system model H0 to uh, 1024 in July of this year on system model H1. Now we've made a lot of improvements to the hardware and control system and the calibration procedures to get the extra performance to get there. It's trending about uh, 10 times increase a year in quantum volume, and we hope to continue that trend.
Now let's shift gears a little bit and talk about Quantinium software offerings. So uh, normally there's a big gap between you know, somebody publishing a paper on how an algorithm works and actually making it useful for someone in the real world. What we've seen in the past few years is that more and more startups and are uh, filling in that gap by helping companies map real world problems to something a quantum computer can calculate and then come up with the actual quantum program that can be run on real hardware. What Cambridge Quantum, now part of Quantinuum, has done is to build a suite of software tools that makes it easier for users and developers to extract value from quantum computers. The tools cover quantum chemistry, quantum machine learning, optimization, quantum natural language processing, and cybersecurity. These tools have been developed through working with companies with real use cases, it's shown up here. Cambridge Quantum also offers an open source development toolkit, which enables state-of-the-art optimization and manipulation of quantum circuits for uh, NISC devices. So you can write quantum programs in a variety of different input languages, and Ticket will automatically translate them uh, for to, so to be able to run on a range of quantum devices and simulators and optimizes your circuit in the process. Some of the hardware platforms include IBM, Continuum, Google, Rigetti, IonQ, AWS, Microsoft, Atos, etc. And this is what we mean by hardware agnostic. This is very important to us at Continuum because we need to support this vibrant quantum ecosystem where people are testing lots of different ideas and we collectively as a community are trying to figure out how to build and use quantum computers. By working together, we can get a lot further in developing this new technology. Now, if you prefer to skip the upper layer of quantum software or maybe use other software tools instead, you can still access our trapped ion quantum computers directly. Basically, we can accept any program in the open quantum assembly language with extensions for special features on our systems that are currently uh, not supported by OpenCASM. Now our compiler will translate the OpenCASM code into a schedule of transport and gate operations. So uh, as the user, uh, you don't have to worry about that. These lower level instructions are sent to the control system to be executed on the actual hardware and the measurement results are returned to the user via cloud portal. The H1 systems are currently available on Azure Quantum as well. So users have a few options to choose from. It's probably useful to look at some of the uh, programs different companies have run on the H-series trapped ion quantum computers. Now, many of these industrial companies uh, partner with quantum software developers or academic research groups uh, to work on these projects. And it has been very helpful for us to work with different software partners and see how different people uh, use our quantum computers. Your example uh, is DHL and Cambridge Quantum. Um, they use a BQE type algorithm for optimizing package, um, optimal, uh, to optimize uh, packing boxes of varying weights and sizes into a container. Um, it's called a knapsack problem. And for a small number of boxes, our quantum computer was able to find the optimal solution there. The program from uh, Samsung and Imperial College London was a simulation of the dynamics of an interacting spin model, where they were able to run deep circuits with as many as 100 two-qubit gates. Uh, this is with the objective of someday using quantum simulation to find better materials for phone batteries and other things. For BMW and, and, and Tropka Labs, 
and they were interested in optimizing supply chain. And they show that the performance of the recursive QAOA algorithm they ran was actually comp uh, comparable to the classical heuristics. And fi finally, this Merck and Zapata also had a quantum machine learning algorithm that optimizes supply chains. Now, to be clear, none of these examples are ahead of scale uh, that would be useful to companies at this stage. But we learn so much from actually doing it. And people learn how to apply different approaches to get better results and optimize their algorithms and take advantage of features like mid circuit measurements and qubit reuse. This is part of being uh, quantum ready so that these companies are prepared to take advantage of the latest quantum computing hardware as soon as it comes out. Because one day quantum computing is going to see classical computing capabilities um, and uh, people want to be ready for that. So going forward, uh, we will eventually need to perform fault tolerant quantum computing for calculations that require lower error rates than what we can reach with physical, qubit, with physical qubits. So uh, in this recent paper, uh, Karen Ryan Anderson and Natalie Brown on our theory team show a first ever demonstration of repeated rounds of quantum error correction using the color code with real-time correction that was enabled by H1's conditional branching capability. The color code uh, that was implemented has seven data qubits and three ancilla qubits. We start by encoding the logical qubit and rotating it into an initial state. This color code has two stages of syndrome extraction. If the first stage is flat, then it goes into the second stage uh, and to perform more, uh, to extract the second round of uh, syndrome extraction. Otherwise, uh, it skips the second part. Now, these errors are tracked in software as they accumulate. And the correction is applied uh, right be uh, at the end, uh, be right before the measurement of the logical qubit. So uh, the actual circuit for the syndrome extraction stage looks like this. It's a lot of CNOTs uh, and uh, we also have some, some measurements in there as well. We were able to perform up to six QEC cycles and measure the logical error rate for the six orthogonal logical sta uh, qubit states. The logical qubit picks up about 2% uh, error for each cycle of quantum error correction, uh, which is still worse than the physical qubit error rate, but uh, the corrected uh, logical qubit is better than uh, if we didn't do any correction at all on it. So uh, we've looked at the error sources and uh, half the error is due to the dephasing in our qubits um, and the remaining logical uh, qubit errors are mostly due to physical gate errors um, with a small amount of, uh, from state preparation and measurement um, and also crosstalk from our measurement. So uh, we know that we need, uh, so now we know what we need to focus on in order to, perform, uh, to improve these uh, logical qubit error rates. So to summarize what we've done so far in terms of fault tolerant quantum computing, um, we've demonstrated logical qubit encoding and logical qubit readout, uh, including encoding a magic state uh, with an error rate below the threshold for distillation. We've demonstrated the uh, fault tolerant quantum error correction cycle, which means multiple rounds of syndrome extraction we did uh, real-time decoding of syndromes, tracking those errors in real time in software and actually applying the correction in real time as well. Now these items that have asterisks next to them uh, are the first ever demonstrations uh, that were shown in this paper. 
And we did this all on system model H1, uh, which means any of you, our users can program H1 to do uh, these types of, error, uh, these types of uh, quantum error correction experiments as well. Uh, but we still have two remaining milestones for fault tolerant quantum computing uh, that we have uh, yet to show. One is getting uh, past the break even point where the logical qubit error rate uh, is actually lower than the uh, error rate on the physical qubit. And the other one is uh, demonstrating uh, quantum error correction uh, on two logical qubits uh, and, and performing a full. Uh, two qubit gate on the logical qubits. So we've, we're working on that um, and we're hopeful that we will be able to check off the full list of necessary steps for fault tolerant quantum computing in the near future. Maybe more people uh, hopefully will use our systems for testing uh, different uh, error correction codes um, and look at the impact of noise and other systematics uh, on, on these uh, uh, fault tolerant quantum computing schemes. I think it's very important that we learn how uh, to operate um, and design systems uh, that can do uh, fault tolerant quantum computing and uh, try to improve uh, upon that. And I think there is much we can learn there. So looking forward, uh, we have some uh, roadmap uh, for the H-series quantum computers. Um, this is what we're uh, ex uh, expecting for the next decade uh, for trapped ion quantum computer development on our H-series platform. Here, we are currently here uh, at uh, H1 uh, with 10 or more qubits, and we're working on increasing the number of qubits as well as fidelities on the system. And we have, still have a lot of room to grow there. Now these systems uh, gets progressively larger uh, and more capable as we go, going from a 1D kind of geometry to a two-dimensional geometry, uh, incorporating new features such as junction transport um, and integrated photonics. So by the end of this decade, we expect to be in the fully fault-tolerant quantum computing regime. For trap ions, fault tolerant quantum computing requires much lower overhead compared to most other systems because of the excellent fidelities in trapped ion quantum computing operations and features like all to all connectivity. So, this is very promising in terms of scaling. Uh, I can show you some of the progress we've been making uh, towards these future systems. So, here's a chip. Uh, showing the H2 track, uh, and this looks, uh, which looks like a racetrack. Um, it's currently trapping ions in the lab, as you can see in this image. It has more storage zones and more operation zones compared to H1, uh, which means more qubits in the quantum computer. And here in this video, uh, you can see that we're able to transport ion, an ion um, all the way around the racetrack. Um, so we're only showing part of the racetrack here, uh, but you can see track the ions, uh, ion as it goes, uh, move from zone to zone. So uh, the, uh, this, this uh, racetrack uh, trap has a low zone at the end of this curved region. Uh, we can operate this trap with some of the electrodes tied together um, and that helps us re reduce the number of signals uh, we needed uh, to control those, the, the trap. So for model H3, uh, we were expecting to move to a 2D geometry and we built this test chip to demonstrate uh, junction transport. And we we're able to do that very consistently and with very low heating. Uh, and so, so this video on the left, uh, is showing an ion going through a junction. So, uh, and we can make it turn corners in whichever direction we want it to go. Um, we can even hold it in this middle center of the uh, junction uh, for quite a long time without uh, running into problems. So uh, we're working on additional uh, prototypes for H3. Uh, so this is uh, very exciting uh, to see.
And going forward, we will need integrated photonic devices on the track to be able to deliver beams to lots of zones. And Jonathan Holm will be talking uh, more about their excellent progress in this area um, right after this talk. And um, there are other ion, uh, trapped ion groups like MIT Lincoln Labs and Sandia National Labs uh, who have also done uh, a lot of work uh, in, in uh, photon integrated photonics. And so we're still in the middle of developing these photonic devices. And here are some photos of the test chips we've built and some characterizations of their output beams. Um, and there's a lot more work to be done to make an integrated photonic system scalable for ion traps. But I think it's going to be, it's very promising uh, from all the great results uh, that people have shown. Um, and on the final note, I want to thank our entire team of scientists, engineers, and supporting staff at Quantinuum, who has contributed to the work I presented here and made it possible to provide the highest performance trapped ion quantum computers for people to use. If you're interested in using our quantum computers or our software, or would like to partner with us, uh, please contact us via email through our website at quantinuum.com. I would like to uh, also mention that uh, there are a couple of programs uh, that provides uh, researchers access to our machines. Uh, the first is the Quantum Computing User Program uh, managed by Oak Ridge National Lab. And another one is the Azure Quantum Credits Program uh, from Microsoft. So you can submit your proposals online uh, and if you get selected, uh, you can run your quantum program on H1. So uh, it's really exciting time in quantum computing and it's great to have more people join the community and accelerate the technology development. I look forward to hearing more about uh, all the great progress everyone's making. Thank you. <laughs>